You know, there are so many myths about God and his government, specifically about God's law, that many people have been made to believe to be true. But none of them is found in the Bible. Well, today in the truth that set free, we are going to discover some myth about God's law and what the Bible really says about that. Don't go anywhere because this will change your life. I will be right back. Welcome back, dear friend. This is Pastor Isaac Apple, and I'm so excited that we can be together right here on the truth that set free as we discover the important truth about God. You see, the Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall surely make you free. It is only the truth that set free. That is why we need to come to God, because the Bible says Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. When you have him, you will be liberated from every form of error and lies that is controlling the mind of many people today. So today in this special edition, we are going to look at some myth about God's law. What many people have been made to believe about God's law that is not even in the Bible. If this is your first time, please make sure to click on subscribe so that you don't miss any of the episodes that we share here because it will be a blessing onto your life. If you're watching this on Hope TV Ghana, I want you to know that we are here every Sunday, seven o'clock in the morning, so be sure to Put it on your calendar and join us every Sunday morning for the truth that set free. God bless you so much. All right. You see, there are so many things that we have been made to believe about the Bible. But unfortunately, most of them are not even biblical. Let me give you an example. You know, when we were growing up, going to church, we were told that when Christ was born, he was visited by three wise men. And that these wise men brought gifts to Jesus Christ when he was born. We have heard this story over and over. In fact, it's a very common story. We have read about it. We have watched cartoons. We have watched movies. In fact, some of us probably have even played a role of that in a church drama during, you know, Christmas celebration and all that. But you see, the truth is that nowhere in the Bible are we told that when Christ was born, he was visited by three wise men. The Bible rather says that when Christ was born, wise men from the east visited him. And these wise men presented three items. The Bible did not specifically mention that they were three. You see, this is just by the way. And this just goes to prove to the fact that many of us accept things that we hear. We have grown with certain understanding about the Bible, about God, about his law, about his ways. That's are just traditions handed over to us from generation to generation. But we ourselves, we have not taken the time to discover what the word really says. Many of us, we go to church, we go for Bible studies, and we just listen. We don't refer, we don't inquire, we don't ask questions, because it's like whatever the man of God says is final. But we need to understand that the man of God is a human being and he can make mistakes. And so when it comes to God's law, there are so many traditions that have been handed over to us from years to years, from our parents, from our church leaders, that are not biblical. And today we want to discover some of these myths and what the Bible really says about God and his law so that we can be set free. Because if you are a child of God, you must fear God. And that word to fear God is not about being scared or afraid of God, but rather it is about giving reverence to God. It is about living a life of obedience. When we obey God, we are fearing him. And we can only fear God when we have enough or good information, biblical information about his requirements. Because when it comes to fearing God, it is not about what I think, it is about what God says to me. That is how we must fear God. So what are some of the myths about God's law that we have been told and we have been made to believe, we have accepted it? Probably some of you have even preached about it, but these are not biblical. 
The first one is that Jesus has fulfilled the law. And because of that, we don't need to obey the law anymore. You see, people who normally preach or talk about this particular, you know, stuff, normally quote what Jesus Christ said in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And unfortunately, most of the time, it is quoted out of context. Let's read what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Do not think that I came to do away with the law or the prophet. I came not to do away with them, but to fulfill them. Again, another test that they quote to defend the fact that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law and that we don't need to obey any law is Luke 16, verse 16, where it says, The law and the prophet were unto John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth unto it. Now, this is very, very interesting. Now, what is more interesting is the fact that those who believe this always ignore the first part of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. That says that, do not think that I came to do away with the law and the prophet. They, they ignore that part and only focus mainly on the meaning of the word fulfill. Because it says that Jesus Christ said, I did not come to do away with the law, yes, but I came to fulfill it. And so to fulfill according to this theory means that Christ is the law. He has obeyed the law for me. So once I have Christ in my heart, I don't need to obey any law again. Now, if you interpret it this way, you are going to have a lot of problem. If the word fulfill in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, is interpreted as to do away with God's law, then it also means that Jesus Christ came to do away with all righteousness. Let me explain. You see, when Jesus Christ came to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist, John, when he saw that this is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, obviously, I mean, John said, no, 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 I can't baptize you. You ought to baptize me. But Jesus Christ said something in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to what he said. He said, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for it does become to fulfill all righteousness that he suffered him. Now, the word fulfill in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, when Christ was being baptized, is the same Greek word that is used for, for fulfill in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And so if the fulfill in Matthew 5, 17 means to do away with God's law, then it means that Jesus Christ also said, let it be now, baptize me now, so that we can do away with all righteousness. Because he said, baptize me, so that we can fulfill all righteousness. You see, my dear friend, that is wrong. That's why I say it's a bit. To fulfill is to make perfect, not to do away. After all, Jesus Christ started Matthew 5, Verse 17 by saying, do not think I came to do away with the law. I did not come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill it. In other words, I came to make the law even more powerful. I came to make it perfect. In fact, I came to give you the power and the strength to do all things. In other words, to live an obedient life to glorify God. That is what it means. Don't let anybody confuse you by telling you that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law for us, so we do not know more to obey any law. If somebody comes to you with that, ask the person, so which law has Christ fulfilled? Which of them? And which of them am I not supposed to obey anymore? Is it thou shalt not kill? Hmm? Is it thou shalt not steal? Hmm? Is it thou shalt not commit adultery? I mean, you see, it does not really make sense because Christ came to give us the grace to be perfect. And to be perfect means to live your life or our lives according to the perfect requirements of God. That is his law. Second myth, God's laws are too hard to obey. This is what many people have been made to believe. In fact, I was told and I believed it some years back that God's laws are too difficult. In fact, you can't obey God's law. That is why Jesus Christ has fulfilled it for us. And so this has become a common anthem of many people. And unfortunately, it has become the anthem of people who do not want to surrender the entire self to Christ. It's only because such people are carnal. And because, you see, when you have a carnal mind, God's law will be difficult for you. But when you have the Spirit of God, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Hallelujah. When you read Romans chapter 7, verse 14, and then Romans chapter 8, verse 7, the Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, 
sold under sin, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So the carnal mind would find God's law to be very difficult to obey, because according to God's word, the carnal mind is not subject to God's law. It is an enmity against God. It is only because we do not have Christ living in our hearts. That is why sometimes we think that it is difficult to do that, says the Lord. No, God's laws are not difficult. If you have Jesus Christ living in you, obeying God is very easy. Because it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things, continue for me, through Christ who strengthens me. And the all things there include obeying God's law, not because I have some special strength, but because Christ lives in me and his spirit enables me. You see, the Holy Spirit is an enabling spirit. He enables us to do the things that our carnal nature could not do. That is what it means. It does not mean that God's law is too hard to obey. No. Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, then obey my commandment. And so, my dear friend, there is really no such thing as God's law being too difficult to obey. It is a myth. The Bible is very clear. In fact, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 really answers this question. It says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not difficult. They are not difficult. Just think about it. You live with your father or your brother or an uncle who takes care of you, and then he gives you laws to obey in the house. When you wake up in the morning, do this and that and that. But the things that he's asking to do, he knows very well that you cannot do them. And you yourself, you know that it is impossible. It is beyond your strength. You can't. No human being can do it. How would you see that brother or that father or that uncle? That person will obviously be a very wicked person to give laws that cannot be obeyed. God's laws are within our willpower. That is why he gives us his Holy Spirit that we will be able to obey. So my dear friend, God's law is not too difficult. You can do it through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Myth number three. Now, the third myth is that God's laws has been done away. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, the question is, does this test mean that the law of God has been done away with? You see, many people use this test and say, oh, no, no, no. We are not justified by obeying the law. We are justified by faith through grace. We are justified by grace through faith. And so because of that, the law has been done away. We are under a new dispensation. Is that what the Bible really says? You see, the answer is obviously no. Because, you see, the Bible identifies or defines sin in this way. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. The Bible defines sin as, Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is trans breaking God's law. And again, when you read Romans chapter 3, verse 23, listen to them. The Bible says, For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. This means that all of us, we have broken God's law. We are all guilty. We all sin against God. And as lawbreakers, what awaits us is death. Because Romans 6, 23 says that for the wages of sin is death. So we are all destined to die because we all broke God's law, God's holy commandment. Why? Because as I said, 1 John 3, 4 makes us understand that sin is the transgression of the law of God. Now, instead of us dying, this is what happened. Instead of us dying for our transgressions or our sins, Jesus Christ took the place for us and died for us, thereby giving us grace. Now, by the way, grace is another chance to life. Grace is pardon. Instead of you facing the consequences of your evil doings, you have been given an opportunity. Somebody has taken your place. That is all that God did, grace. So he said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So just by having faith in Jesus, listen to this, what that verse means. Just by having faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, God pardons you and you become his son again. Simple as that. 
You don't need to obey the law that you already broke in order for you to be saved from the curse of the law. You need faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the one who lived in this world perfectly with no, without sinning and died for you and me. So when you obey Christ and you accept him as your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are pardoned. Okay? You are pardoned immediately. You are forgiven. Your sins are, are all wiped off. That moment, you, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to recite anything. You don't need to, I mean, carry out any special activity. You don't need to obey any law. You just have to believe in Jesus Christ. Then you are pardoned, grace. Now, when you are pardoned, you, you now become a child of God. Then God grants you his Holy Spirit. He teaches you, that he strengthens you to do what? To obey the law that you could not obey when you were in your carnal mind or when you were in your carnal state. I hope you understand. That is why earlier when I said in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, that the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And so, as sinners, we are saved by grace. Faith is all that you need. Believe in Jesus Christ and you are saved. But when you become a child of God, do you continue to live in your sin? No. You now live a life of obedience. So God then would make a new covenant with us through faith, your faith in him, through his son, he will make a new covenant. His holy laws would then be written in your heart. That is why he says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 to 17. Again, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, as I said earlier on, the Bible says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. In other words, they are not difficult. So the question is, what does it mean to do away with God's law? You see, since the purpose of the law is to enable us to know sin, as Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 to 8, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known last, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Therefore, when you do away with God's law, you do away with sin. Because according to Romans chapter 5, verse 13, there is no sin when there is no law. If we do away with the law, we do away with sin. And we do away with the need for a sin bearer, Jesus Christ. That, you see what the devil is trying to do? Because you see, when you break God's law, you are, you are directed to Jesus Christ, the sin bearer, to cleanse you and to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you can obey God again. The devil is now teaching that God's law is no more in existence. He has, it has been done away. And because of that, you do not need to obey him. What the devil is trying to do is gradually, through this teaching, to do away with God's government. Because no government can be established without law. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, the Bible says, But now he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. You see, the greatest difference between the religion of the Old Testament and that of the New Testament is the fact that in the New Testament era, we are introduced by the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Old Testament saints looked forward to the blessings of Messianic age and the promise of salvation. In the New Testament, the people of God, as God's people, we are confronted with the question, would you accept Jesus Christ, whom God sent as a Messiah, and be saved? But the truth is that the moral requirement remains unchanged. Because these moral requirements of God's Ten Commandments are founded on God's government. They are God's character. They remain unchanged. You can never do away with the law of God and expect God to bless you. God's laws are the foundation of his government and they are binding forever and ever. It will never change because God will never change. Now before I continue, there's one thing I want us to understand and that is, in the Old Testament, there are several laws, okay? There are several laws that govern the people of God. And these laws can be grouped into several categories. We have, number one, the moral laws. Number two, the ceremonial laws. Number three, the civil laws. And number four, um, statutes and judgments. And then number five, health laws. Now, the moral law 
is summed up by the Ten Commandments that is found in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 17. This law sums up the moral requirement of humanity. Again, the ceremonial law also regulated the sanctuary rituals, describing the various offerings and the individual citizens' responsibilities, the feast days, and, and all the things that were required of the people of God. Then, that was the ceremonial law. Then we have the civil law. These are based on the moral law. In fact, these laws, they define a citizen's relationship to civil authorities and to his or her own fellow you know, friends or citizens. And so the civil laws, they are the laws that name the kind of penalties that you would face when you break um, any of the moral laws. Then we also have the health laws. Now the health laws overlap the other laws. The health laws are the laws relating to uncleanness. They are what is considered ceremonially clean and ceremonially unclean. But they also go beyond this to include how to keep our bodies well, how to maintain proper hygiene in the place where we stay, the kind of food we ought to eat, the kind of food we ought to avoid, and everything about our health. These were all enshrined in the health laws. Laws regarding clean and unclean, as I just said, these were all enshrined in the health laws. Now, when we keep them, then God will bless us. In the Old Testament, the people of God were required to keep all of them. But when Christ came, Christ nailed all of them to the cross with the exception of the moral law. The moral law is still binding. The moral law is the Ten Commandments. Because listen, let's be frank. Every Christian knows that it is against the will of God or the word of God to steal. Every Christian knows that you should not worship any idols. I mean, nobody is debating about that. So when somebody comes to you telling you the law of God has been nailed to the cross, ask the person, which of the laws? Which of them? We need to know the truth. Otherwise, we'll believe in myth and you'll be destroyed. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because they have rejected knowledge. I would also reject thee, that thou shalt be no praise for me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I would also forget thy children. When you neglect obedience to God, God says, I will forget you. So don't let anybody confuse you that God's laws have been done away. They have not been done away. They are still binding because that is the foundation of the government of God. Now, the next myth that people have been made to believe is that God's law is faulty. That is a very serious accusation, that God's laws are faulty. You see, the Bible rather says the people had fault. The people were faulty. Okay, <laughs> according to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, the Bible says that God found fault with the people. Okay, it is not the law. And so God's law has no problem. But the people who were required to obey the law, they were the problem. That is why in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, the Bible says, the law was weak through the flesh. So God's law is perfect. As King David says in the book of Psalms, it is holy. But the people were weak without Christ. We were carnal. We were weak. We cannot obey it. You see, the law of God has always been perfect, but the people are faulty and weak. So God would have his own son live with us that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us according to Romans chapter 8 verse 4 through the indwelling of Christ. When we come to Jesus Christ, he fills us with power to obey what we could not obey. In our carnal mind, our carnal state, we cannot obey God. I hope you understand. But pastor, if all that you are saying is true, what does it mean? When Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says that we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Well, my dear friend, listen. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, the Bible says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming cursed for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. Now the curse of the law is death. According to Romans chapter 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ tasted death for everyone. In other words, he took the curse of the law, which is sin. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, 
The Bible says, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, that by the grace of God he might taste the death for everyone. Thus he redeemed all from the curse of the law, and in its place provided eternal life. So you see, Jesus Christ redeemed us from the death that we were supposed to die. He did not redeem us from the law because the law is not a curse. Obeying God's law is a blessing. It leads to prosperity. But that's in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 to 17, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, teach that God's laws ended at the cross. No, no, no. I explained this earlier on. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 to 17 says, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 also says, By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. You see, dear friend, these passages both refer to the law containing ordinances or Moses' law, which was a ceremonial law governing the sacrificial system and the priesthood. All of this ceremony and rituals foreshadowed the cross and ended at the death of Jesus Christ, just as God intended it. The law of Moses was added, according to the Bible, till the seed should come. And that seed is Jesus Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. God's law is not what the Bible is saying here. Because Paul said that the law of God is holy, many years after the cross. So God's law was not done away. So don't let anybody confuse you. What was nailed to the cross is the other laws that I've already explained. All right, The moral law, the Ten Commandments, is still binding. And as Christians, we have been empowered by God through his spirit, to obey his law. Remember, the Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If this message has been a blessing to you, why don't you share it with somebody so that somebody can also know the truth that set free. If you have any question, or there's something bothering you about the explanation I gave you, please, our WhatsApp number is on the screen. Be sure to get into contact with us as soon as possible, and we'll be there to help you with an answer. Remember, God says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We shall come here once again next week with another edition of The Truth That Set Free. Shalom.